Hello everyone. Today we'll, we will be reading The Introduction to The Princess Bride, S. Morgenstern's classic tale of true love and high adventure by William Goldman. Again, this is the introduction. The introduction is nothing like the rest of the book. The introduction is just William Goldman telling you um, how he came upon the story and um, his experience with the story. Here we go. So you should be following along with your copy on the Google Classroom assignment for today. This is my favorite book in all the world, though I have never read it. How is such a thing possible? I'll do my best to explain. As a child, I had simply no interest in books. I hated reading. I was very bad at it, and besides, how could you take the time to read when there were games that shrieked for playing? Basketball, baseball, marbles, I could never get enough. I wasn't even good at them, but give me a football and an empty playground, and I could invent last-second triumphs that would bring tears to your eyes. School was torture. Miss Roginsky, who was my teacher for the third through fifth grades, would have meeting after meeting with my mother. I don't feel Billy is perhaps extending himself quite as much as he might, or when we test him, Billy does really exceptionally well considering his class standing, or most often. I don't know, Mrs. Goldman. What are we going to do about Billy? What are we going to do about Billy? That was the phrase that haunted me those first ten years. I pretended not to care, but secretly I was petrified. Everyone and everything was passing me by. I had no real friends, no single person who shared an equal interest in all games. I seemed busy, 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 but I suppose if I pressed, if pressed, I might have admitted that for all my frenzy, I was very much alone. What are we going to do about you, Billy? I don't know, Mr. Ginsky. How could you have failed this reading test? I've heard you use every word with my own ears. I'm sorry, Mrs. R Miss Roginsky. I must not have been thinking. You're always thinking, Billy. You just weren't thinking about the reading test. I could only nod. What was it this time? I don't know. I can't remember. Was it Stanley Hack again? Stan Hack was the Cubs' third baseman for these and many other years. I saw him play once from a bleacher seat, and even at the dis th that distance, he had the sweetest smile I had ever seen, and to this day I swear he smiled at me several times. I just worshipped him. He could also hit a ton. Bronco Nagurski. He's a football player. A great football player. And the paper last night said he might come back and play for the Bears again. He retired when I was little. But if he came back and I could get someone to take me to a game, I could see him play. And maybe if whoever took me also knew him, I could meet him after. And maybe if he was hungry, I might let him have a sandwich and I might, I might have brought with me. I was trying to figure out what kind of sandwich Bronco Nagurski would like. She just sagged at her desk. You've got a wonderful imagination, Billy. I don't know what I said. Probably thank you or something. I can't harness it, though, she went on. Why is that? I think it's probably that I need glasses or I don't read because the words are so fuzzy. That would explain why I'm all the, all the time squinting. Maybe if I went to an eye doctor who could give me glasses, I'd be the best reader in the class and you wouldn't have to keep me after school so much. She just pointed behind her. Get to work cleaning the blackboards, Billy. Yes, ma'am. I was the best at cleaning blackboards. Do they look fuzzy, Miss Roginsky said after a while. Oh, no. I just made that up. I never squinted either. But she just seemed so whipped about it. She always did. This had been going on for three grades now. I'm just not getting through to you somehow. It's not your fault, Miss, Miss Roginsky. It wasn't. I just worshipped her, too. She was all dumpy and fat, but I used to wish she'd been my mother. I could never make that really come out right unless she had been married to my father first and they got gotten divorced and my father had married my mother, which was okay because Miss, Rog got, Miss Roginsky had to work, so my father got custody of me. That all made sense. Only they never seemed to know each other, my dad and Miss Roginsky. Whenever they'd meet, each year during the Christmas pageant, when all the parents came, I'd watch the two of them like crazy, hoping for some kind of secret glimmer or look that could only mean, well, how are you? How's your life been going since our divorce? But no soap. She wasn't my mother. She was just my teacher. And I was her own personal and growing disaster area. You're going to be all right, Billy. I sure hope so, Miss Roginsky. You're a late bloomer, that's all. Winston Churchill was a late bloomer, and so are you. I was about to ask her who he played for, but there was something in her tone that made me know enough not to. And Einstein. Him, I also didn't. Or what a late bloomer was. 1941, autumn. I'm a little cranky because my radio won't get the football games. Northwestern is playing Notre Dame. It starts at 1, and by 1.30 I can't get the game. Music, news, soap operas, everything, but not the biggie. I call for my mother. She comes. I tell her my radio's busted. I can't find the Northwestern no Notre Dame. She says, you mean the football? Yes, 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 I say. It's Friday. She says, I thought they played on Saturday. Am I an idiot? I lie back, listening to the soaps, and after a little while, 
I try finding it again, and my stupid radio will pick up every Chicago station except the one carrying the football game. I really holler now, and again my mother tears in. I'm going to heave this radio right out the window, I say. It won't get it. It won't get it. I cannot make it get it. Get what, she says. The football game, I say. How dumb are you? The game. Saturday, and watch your tongue, young man, she says. I already told you. It's Friday, she goes again. Was there ever so ample a dunce? Humiliated, I flick around on my trusty zenith trying to find the football game. It was so frustrating. I was lying there sweating and my stomach felt crazy and I was pounding the top of the radio to make make it work right. And that was how they discovered I was delirious with pneumonia. Pneumonia today is not what it once was, especially when I had it. Ten days or so in the hospital and then home for the long recuperating period. I guess it was three more weeks in bed, a month maybe. No energy, no games even. I was just this lump going through a strength-gathering time period which is how you have to think of me when I came upon the Princess Bride. It was my first night home, drained, still one sick cookie. My father came in. I thought to say goodnight. He sat on the end of my bed. Chapter one, the bride, he said. It was then only I kind of looked up and saw he was holding a book. That alone was surprising. My father was next to illiterate in English. He came from Florin, the setting of the Princess Bride, and there had been no fool, and there he had been no fool. He said once he would have ended up a lawyer, and maybe so. The facts are, when he was 16, he got a shot at coming to America, gambled on the land of opportunity, and lost. There was never much here for him. He was not attractive to look upon, very short and from an early age bald, and he was ponderous at learning. Once he got a fact, it stayed, but the hours it took to pass into his cranium were not to be believed. His English always stayed ridiculously immigrantly, and that didn't help him either. He met my mother on the boat over, got married later, and when he thought they could afford it, had me. He worked forever as the number two chair in the least successful barber shop in Highland Park, Illinois. Toward the end, he used to doze all day in his chair. He went that way. He was gone an hour before the number one guy realized it. Until then, he just thought my father was having a good doze. Maybe he was. Maybe that. Maybe that's all any of this is. When they told me, I was terribly upset, but I thought at the same time it was an almost existence-proving way for him to go. Anyway, I said, huh? What? I didn't hear. I was so weak, so terribly tired. Chapter one, the bride. He held up the book then. I'm reading it to you for relax. He practically shoved the book in my face. By S. Morgenstern, great Florinese writer, the Princess Bride. He too came to America, S. Morgenstern, dead now in New York. The English is his own. He spoke eight tongues. Here my father put down the book and held up all his fingers. Eight. Once in Florin City, I was in his cafe. He shook his head now. He was always doing that, my father, shaking his head when he'd said it wrong. Not his cafe. He was in it, me too, the same time. I saw him, S. Morgenstern. He had head like that, this, that big. And he shaved his hands like a big, great big balloon. Great man in Florin City. Not so much in America. Has it got any sports in it? Fencing, fighting, torture, poison, true love, hate, revenge, giants, hunters, bad men, good men, beautifulest ladies. Snakes, spiders, beasts of all natures and descriptions, pain, death, brave men, coward men, strongest men, chases, escapes, lies, truths, passion, miracles. Sounds okay, I said. I kind of closed my eyes. I'll do my best to stay awake, but I'm awfully sleepy, Daddy. Who can know when his world is going to change? Who can tell before it happens that every prior experience, all the years, were a preparation for nothing? Picture this now. An all but illiterate illiterate old man struggling with an enemy tongue. An all but exhausted young boy fighting against sleep. And nothing between them but the words of another alien, painfully translated from native sounds to foreign. Who could suspect that in the morning a different child would wake? I remember for myself only trying to beat back fatigue. Even a week later I was not aware of what had begun that night. The doors that were slamming shut while others slid into the clear. Perhaps I should have at least known something, but maybe not. Who can sense revelation in the wind? What happened was just this. I got hooked on the story. For the first time in my life, I became actively interested in a book. Me, the sports fanatic. Me, the game freak. Me, the only 10-year-old in Illinois with a hate on for the alphabet, wanted to know what happened next. What became of the beautiful buttercup and poor Wesley and Inigo, the greatest swordsman in the history of the world? And how really strong was Fezzik? And were there limits to the cruelty of Vizzini, the devil Sicilian? Each night my father read to me, chapter by chapter, always fighting to sound the words properly, to nail down the sense, and I lay there, eyes kind of closed, my body slowly beginning the long flow back to strength. 
It took, as I said, probably a month, and in that time he read The Princess Bride twice to me. Even when I was able to read myself, this book remained his. I would never have dreamed of opening it. I wanted his voice, his sounds. Later, years later even, sometimes I might say, how about the duel on the cliff with Inigo and the man in black? And my father would gruff and grumble and get the book and lick his thumb, turning pages till the mighty battle began. I loved that. Even today, that's how I summon back my father when, he need, when the need arises. Slumped and squinting and halting over words, giving me Morgenstern's masterpiece as best he could, the princess bride belonged to my father. Everything else was mine. There wasn't an adventure story anywhere that was safe from me. Come on, I would say to Miss Roginsky when I was well again. Stevenson, you keep saying Stevenson. I finished Stevenson. Who now? And she would say, well, try Scott. See how you like him. So I tried old Sir, Sir Walter, and I liked him well enough to butt through half a dozen books in December. A lot of that was Christmas vacation when I didn't have to interpret my reading for anything, but now and then a little food. Who else? Who else? Cooper, maybe, she'd say. And so off I went to the deer slayer and all the leather stocking stuff. And then on my own one day, I stumbled on Dumas. And D'Artagnan, and that got me through most of February, those guys. You have become before my eyes a novel holic, Miss Roginsky said. Do you realize you are spending more time now reading than you, than you used to spend on games? Do you know that your arithmetic grades are actually getting worse? I never minded when she knocked me. We were alone in the schoolroom, and I was after her for some I was after her for somebody good to devour. She shook her head. You are certainly blooming, Billy, before my very eyes. I just don't know what into what. I just stood there and waited for her to tell me to read somebody. You're impossible, standing there waiting, she thought a good second. All right, try Hugo, the hunchback of Notre Dame. Hugo, I said, hunchback, thank you, and I turned, ready to be, begin my sprint to the library. I heard her words, sighed behind me as I moved. This can't last, it just can't. But it did, and it has. And I am as devoted to adventure now as then, and that's never going to stop. My whole life really began with my father reading me the Morgenstern when I was ten. That book was the single best thing that happened to me. Sorry about that, Helen. Helen is my wife, the hotshot child psychiatrist. And long before I was even married, I knew I was going to share it with my son. I knew I was going to have a son, too. So when Jason was born, if he'd been a girl, he would have been Pamby. Can you believe that? A woman psychologist who would give her kids such names? Anyway, when Jason was born, I made a mental note to buy him a copy of The Princess Bride for his 10th birthday. After which I promptly forgot all about. Flash forward, the Beverly Hills Hotel last December. I'm going mad having meetings on Ira Levine's The Stepford Wives, which I am adapting for the silver screen. I call my wife in New York at dinner time, which I always do. It makes her feel wanted. And we're talking, and at the close she says, Oh, we're giving Jason a 10 speed bike. I bought it today. I thought that was fitting, don't you? Why fitting? Oh, come on, Willie. 10 years, 10 speeds. Is he 10 tomorrow? It went clean out of my head. Call us at supper time tomorrow and you can wish him a happy. Helen, I said then, listen, do me something. Buzz the 999 bookshop and have them send over the Princess Bride. Let me get a pencil. And she's gone a while. Okay, shoot. The what bride? Princess by S. Morgenstern. It's a kid's classic. Tell him I'll quiz him on it when I'm back next week and that he doesn't have to like it or anything. But if he doesn't, tell him I'll kill myself. Give him that message exactly, please. I wouldn't want to apply any extra pressure or anything. Willie, it's Helen. I'm in a story conference, Helen, and we're speaking tonight at supper time. Why are you calling at lunch for? Nothing, probably, except the Morgenstern's out of print. I've checked with Double Days, too. They, they, you sounded kind of like it might be important, so I'm just letting you know. Jason will have to be satisfied with his very fitting 10-speed machine. Not important, I said. Thanks, though, anyway. I was about to hang up, and then I said, Well, as long as you've gone this far, call Argosy on 59th Street. They specialize in out-of-print stuff. Argosy, 59th. Got it. Talk to you at supper. She hung up. Willie? Yes, Helen. What is it, Helen? Nothing, but it can't be nothing or you wouldn't have called me. Helen, I'm in the middle of a story conference now. Just get on with it. Argosy doesn't have the book. Nobody has the book. Goodbye, Willie. She hung up. They called me at half past seven. I was in my suite. He loves the bike, Helen said. Oh, wait. I have to explain to you guys what happened. So I took this part out because he just goes on and on and on about the, finding the book. He calls around to, like, every bookstore in New York City. He finally finds a copy of the book in um, English, okay? So now it's his kid's birthday, and he has gotten the book for his birthday. Okay, so now we'll start over. They called me at a half past seven. I was in my suite. He loves the bike, Helen said. He's practically out of control. Babbo, I said. And your books came? And your books came. What books, I said. Cavalier was never more casual. The Princess Bride, in various languages, one of them fortunately English, well, that's nice, I said, still loose. I practically forgot I had, to ha I had, I asked to have them sent. 
Give me the kid. Hi, he said a second later. Listen, Jason, I told him. We thought about giving you a bike for your birthday, but we decided against it. Boy, are you wrong. I got one already. Jason has inherited his mother's total lack of humor. I don't know. Maybe he's funny and I'm not. We just don't laugh much together is all I can say for sure. My son Jason is this incredibly, incredible looking kid. Paint him yellow, he'd mop up for the school sumo team. A blimp. All the time stuffing his face. I watch my weight and old Helen is only visible full front plus on top of what she is of of which she is the leading child shrink in Manhattan, and our kid can roll faster than than he can walk. He's expressing himself through food, Helen always says. His anxieties. When he feels ready to cope, he'll slim down. Hey Jason, Mom tells me this book arrived today, the princess thing. I'd sure like it if maybe you give it a read while I'm gone. I loved it when I was a kid and I'm kind of interested in your reaction. Do I have to love it too? He was his mother's son, all right. Jason, no, just the truth, exactly what you think. I miss you, big shot, and I'll talk to you on your birthday. Boy, are you wrong. Today is my birthday. We bantered a bit more, long past when there was much to say. Then I did the same thing with my spouse and hung up, promising a return by the end of one week. It took two. Conferences dragged. Anyway, I was longer than anticipated in sunny Cal. Finally, though, I was allowed to return to the care and safety of the family, so I quick buzzed to L.A. airport before anybody's mind changed. I got there early, which I always do when I come back, because I had to load up my pockets with doodads and such for Jason. Every time I get home from, from a trip, he runs or waddles to me, hollering, Let me see, let me see the pockets! And then he goes through all my pockets, taking out his graft. And once his, the, the loot is totaled, he gives me a nice hug. Isn't it awful what we'll do in this world to feel wanted? Let me see the pockets, Jason, sh- Jason shouted, moving to me across the foyer. It was supper time Thursday, and while he went through his ritual, Helen emerged from the library and kissed my cheek, going, What a dashing-looking fellow I have, which is also a ritual, and laden with gifts. Jason kind of hugged me and belted off, waddled off to his room. Angelica's just getting dinner on, Helen said. You couldn't have timed it better. Dinner was ready a little later, and with an arm around my wife and an arm around my son, I advanced towards the dining room. I felt at that moment safe, secure, all the nice things. Supper was on the table, cream, spinach, mashed potatoes, gravy, and pot roast. Terrific, except I don't like pot roast, since I'm a rare meat man, but cream spinach I have a lech for. So all in all, a more than edible spread was set across the tablecloth. We sat. Helen served the meat. The rest we passed. Jason was piling the mashed potatoes on his plate with a practiced and steady motion. I smiled at my kid. Hey, I, I tried. Let's go a little easy, huh, fellow? He splatted another fat spoonful onto his plate. Jason, they're just loaded, I said then. I'm really hungry, Dad, he said, not looking at me. Fill up on the meat then, why don't you, I said. Eat all the meat you want. I won't say a word. I'm not eating nothing, Jason said, and he shoved his plate away and folded his arms and stared off into space. If I were a furniture salesperson, Helen said to me, or perhaps a teller in a bank, I could understand. But how could you have spent all these years married to a psychiatrist and talk like that? You're out of the dark ages, Willie. Helen, the boy's overweight. All I suggested was that he might leave a few potatoes for the rest of the world and stuff stuff this lovely prime pot roast your treasure has whipped up for my triumphant return. Willie, I don't want to shock you, but Jason happens to have not only a very fine mind, but also exceptionally keen eyesight. When he looks at himself in the mirror, I assure you he knows he is not slender. That is because he does not choose at this stage to be slender. He's not that far from dating, Helen. What then? Jason is ten, darling, and not interested at this stage in girls. At this stage, he is interested in rocketry. What difference does a slight case of overweight make to a rocket lover? When he chooses to be slender, I assure you, he has both the intelligence and the willpower to become slender. Until that time, please in my presence, do not frustrate the child. I'm not eaten, and that's it, Jason said then. Sweet child, Helen said to the kid in that tone she reserves on this earth only for such moments. Be logical. If you do not eat your potatoes, you will be upset, and I will be upset. Your father clearly is already upset. If you do eat your potatoes, I shall be pleased. You will be pleased. Your tummy will be pleased. We can do nothing about your father. You have it in your power to upset all or one about whom, as I have already said, we can do nothing. Therefore, the conclusion should be clear, but I have faith in your ability to reach it yourself. Do what you will, Jason. He began to stuff it in. You're making a poof out of that kid, I said. Then I took a deep, deep breath, because whenever I come home, there's always trouble, which is because Helen says I bring tension with me. I always need, in, in, I always need inhuman proof that I've been missed, that I'm still needed, loved, etc. All I know is I hate being away, but coming home is the worst. There's never really much chance to go in into, well, what's new since I'm gone, chit-chat, saying that Helen and I talk every night anyway. 
I bet you're a whiz on that bike, I said then. Maybe we'll go for a ride this weekend. Jason looked up from his potatoes. I really love the book, Dad. It was great. I was surprised that he said it, because naturally I was just starting starting to work my way into that subject matter, but then, as Helen's always saying, Jason ain't no dummy. Well, I'm glad, I said, and was I ever. Jason nodded. Maybe it's even the best book I read in all my life. I nibbled away at my spinach. What was your favorite part? Chapter one. Chapter one, the bride, Jason said. That really surprised me. Not that chapter one stinks or anything, but there's not that much that goes on compared with the incredible stuff later. Buttercup grows up mostly is all. How about the climb up the cliffs of insanity, I said then. That's in chapter five. Oh, great, Jason said. And that description of Prince Humpernick's zoo of death? That's in the second chapter. Even greater, Jason said. What knocked me out about it, I said, was that it's this very short little passage on the zoo of death, but yet somehow you just know it's going to be to figure in later. Did you get that same feeling? Uh Uh-huh, Jason nodded. Great. By then I knew he hadn't read it. He tried to read it, Helen cut in. He did read the first chapter. Chapter two was impossible for him. So when he'd made a sufficient and reasonable attempt, I told him to stop. Different people have different tastes. I told him you'd understand, Willie. Of course I understood. (coughs) I felt just so deserted, though. I didn't like it, Dad. I wanted to. I smiled at him. How could he not like it? Passion, duels, miracles, giants, true love. You're not eating the spinach either, Helen said. I got up. Time change. I'm not hungry. She didn't say anything until she heard me open the front door. Where are you going? She called then. If I'd known, I would have answered. I wandered through December. No top coat. Then it got cold. I went home. Helen was going over some notes in bed. Ordinarily, she would come out with something about me being a bit elderly for acts of juvenile behavior, but there must have been danger clinging to me still. I could see it in her smart eyes. He did try, she said finally. I never thought he didn't, I answered. Where's the book? The library, I think. I turned, started out. Can I get you anything? I said no. Then I went to the library, closed myself in, hunted out the princess bride. It was in pretty good shape, I realized, as I checked the binding. I flicked to the title page, which was funny, since I'd never done that before. It was always my father who'd done the handling. I had to laugh when I saw the real title, because because right there it said, The Princess Bride, S. Morgenstern's classic tale of true love and high adventure. You had to admire a guy who called his own new book a classic before it was published and anyone else had a chance to read it. Maybe he figured if he didn't do it, nobody would. Or maybe he was just trying to give the reviewers a helping hand. I don't know. I skimmed the first chapter and it was pretty much exactly as I remembered. Then I turned to the second chapter, the one about Prince Humperdinck and the little kind of tantalizing description of the zoo of death. And that's when I began to realize the problem. Not that the description wasn't there. It was, and again, pretty much as as I remember it. But before you got to it, there were maybe 60 pages of text dealing with Prince Humperdinck's ancestry and how his family got control of Florin and this wedding and that child begating this one over here who then married somebody else. And then I skipped to the third chapter, the courtship. And that was all about the history of Gilder and how that country reached its place in the world. The more I flipped on, the more I knew. Morgenstern wasn't writing any children's book. He was writing a kind of satiric history of his country and the decline of the monarchy in in Western civilization. But my father had only read me the action stuff, the good parts. He never bothered with the serious side of all, at all. About two in the morning, I called my editor. To this day, I know he doesn't understand why I couldn't wait till maybe breakfast. You sure you're all right, Bill, he kept saying. Hey, hear him, I began after about six rings. <clears throat> Listen, you guys published a book just after World War I. Do you think it might be a good idea for me to abridge it and we'll republish it now? <clears throat> you're sure you're all right, Bill? Fine, absolutely, and see, I just use the good parts. I kind of bridge where there were skips in the narrative and leave the good parts alone. What do you think? Bill, it's two in the morning up here. Are you still in California? I acted like I was, all shocked and surprised, so he wouldn't think I was a nut. I'm sorry, Hiram. My God, what an idiot. It's only 11 o'clock in Beverly Hills. Do you think I? you could ask Mr. Jovanovich, though? You mean now? Tomorrow? Or the next day? No big deal. I'll ask him anything, only I'm not quite sure I'm getting an accurate reading on exactly what you want. You're sure you're all right, Bill? I'll be in New York tomorrow. Call you about the specifics, okay? Could you make it a little earlier in the business day, Bill? I laughed and we hung up. So now he goes on about writing the abridgment. Um, And I'll just go on. But the abridgment got done and you hold it in your hands. The good parts version. Why did I go through all that? Helen pressured me greatly to think about an answer. She felt it was important, not that she know necessarily, but that I know. Because you acted crackers, Willie boy, she said. You had me truly scared. So why? I'd 
I know I don't expect this to change anybody else's life the way it altered mine, but take the title words, True Love and High Adventure. I believed in that once. I thought my life was going to follow that path. Prayed that it would. Obviously it didn't, but I don't think there's high adventure left anymore. Nobody takes a sword out nowadays and cries, Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And true love, you can forget about that too. I don't know if I love anything truly anymore. Anyway, here's the good parts version. S. Morgenstern wrote it, and my father read it to me, and now I give it to you. What you do with it will be of more than passing interest to us all.